Let's start with a simple question. Why we need to amend the current landscape when it comes to the international transfer market? Uh, the, the, the simple should be, uh, uh, the, the answer should be simple for all of us. So first of all, as everybody knows here, so the current regulations were draft, designed, approved almost 20 years ago. In 2001, in an amazing continent and in a wonderful country, Argentina, in 2001, the FIFA Congress in Buenos Aires decided to pass new regulations on the status and transfer of players. These regulations are uh, following the agreement between FIFA, UEFA, uh, in a certain way, FIPRO, in March 2001, and also the consequence of the so-called Bosman ruling passed by the European Court of Justice on the 15th December 1995. So the conjunction of all these factors uh, ended up in the transfer regulations 2001 approved by the FIFA Council with three general and highly important principles. The first one was uh, uh, the protection of the contractual stability. This is a very recurrent topic for all of us, for FIPRO, for ECA, for their leaks for the confederations. The second pillar of this agreement at that time was protection of shown players, minors, then the, the, the famous Article 19 of the FIFA transfer regulations. And the final one uh, uh, was uh, training rewards to uh, clubs all around the world. So encourage the training of young players through solidarity Systems at that time, the solidarity mechanism and the training compensation. This is the basis, uh, uh, the, the base of the agreements uh, rendered around 2001 in uh, uh, Buenos Aires following these discussions uh, in March 2001 with the European Commission. You have here on the screen the pre release issue on the 5th of March 2001 by the European Commission in, this, in the context of these negotiations, outcome of the discussions between the Commission and FIFA UEFA on FIFA regulations on international football transfers. Uh, very well-known picture, the UEFA president at that time, FIFA president at that time, the commissioners, particularly Commission Monti. So this press release uh, summarizes what then FIFA uh, implemented in the transfer regulations 2000. One, for instance, uh, I don't know if it is uh, very clear, so creation on an effective, quick, and objective arbitration body with members chosen in equal numbers by players and clubs and with an independent chairman. This is the so-called DRC. Uh, I know and I apologize for this that maybe the system is effective, is objective. We have an independent chairman, but we are not very quick. Um, but we are changing this. We are trying to do our best to change also this landscape, we need to render uh, faster decisions in the context of the DRC Player Status Committee. We are fully committed with this goal, objective. The administration is behind, Eric is here today, so I um, hope we can advance some figures uh, very soon. So it was 2001. Um, since 2001 until today, of course, the football lack landscape has changed a lot. So these figures come from FIFA TMS. Our new head of FIFA TMS, Jax, is around. Thanks for providing me with these figures. So since 2010, that is the first, 2011, the first year of the transfer machine system. So in 2011, we face 11,000 transfer all around the world, international transfer, 2018, 16. Thousand. So imagine in 2001 when the regulations were uh, draft and then adopted by the FIFA Congress. So what can I say? 200, 300, 400, 500? Right now we are dealing with more than 17,000 international transfers every year. So it's obvious that the ecosystem has changed significantly. But it's exactly the same with money. So again, thanks TMS for the figures. 
So first year is 2011, we are almost in 2020, seven billions in 2018, maybe eight billions in 2019. What can we say in 2001? 300 millions, 200 millions, again. So not only the number, also the figures and the money involved in this international transfer is completely different. And these figures, in numbers and also the money, the, the main impact from my understanding on the uh, transfer landscape uh, comes from TV rights. So if you look at the screen, uh, you see here uh, official uh, figures from the Premier League. So since 1992, when this fantastic uh, institution and competition was launched in 1992, but the year in which FIFA, well, sorry, FIFA decided to approve the transfer regulations in 2001. So uh, all clubs, the Premier League in total, they reached the amazing figure of 700 million pounds. So it's money, obviously. Right now, they are dealing with more than um, 8 billion pounds for all clubs overseas and domestic. So, and of course, these figures have an, a big, big, big impact on the transfer market. Exactly the same uh, in my country, in Spain. So 2000, 2001, uh, the, maybe this is not absolutely accurate because I was unable to get figures from uh, uh, the official sources, but we can estimate that in 2001, when the regulations came into force, the first uh, regulations came into force, uh, they got at around 150, 200, uh, right now, 2018, 2019, season 2020, 2021 is 2 billion uh, euros uh, for all Spanish clubs. So again, the impact of TV rights on the international transfer market is huge, and we can explain what is going on just based on these figures. So that's why uh, FIFA and the stakeholders, even though I don't like to speak about stakeholders first, because I used to say, I don't know what does it mean, stakeholders. I would prefer to say FIFA, ECA, FIPRO, the confederations, the associations. You know, we conclude we need to change this and we need to think about the system. Maybe we need to amend the system to the regulations. You have here on the screen some worrying trends, worrying trends of today's transfer market. So again, maybe the same topics, contractual stability, situation of agents, uh, not solidarity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in the end, I think that uh, all parties understood that the situation is not like in 2001, and that's why we need to look at the problem and we need to amend the uh, environment. Uh, This is the roadmap or the history of the regulations on the status and transfer of players. Uh, in the beginning, uh, status on regulations for the status and transfer of players, and then in 2005, 6 we changed for the regulations on the status and transfer of players. For me, it's simple to say the FIFA transfer regulations. So, you know, the first uh, uh, regulations were passed by FIFA in 1991. Now that uh, I'm an insider and I control a little bit the system, so I get access to all these documents and photos. So for me, that I like uh, being more an academic rather than a, a, a practitioner. So you know, I'm always falling in love. So getting in contact with the guy in the archive, I need these regulations and the first FIFA statutes. So it's amazing to, to, to read all these regulations since the beginning. The first were adopted in 1991. Uh, the second version, San Lateranos in, in the meantime, 1997. During this period, we can say that FIFA imposed regulations on the stakeholders. So we had a ring and we govern all with this ring. Uh, the turning point was 2001, obviously. So, you know, it's the first time that FIFA, UEFA, sit with FIPRO in a certain way. And since 2001, until 2017, uh, we can say that there are different versions, 2001, 2005, well, there are different versions. 
what I try is just to uh, uh, copy paste the photos. During these 15 years, the system was based on collaboration. What does it mean? Well, you know, we would like to change something. Maybe it's better if we check with FIPRO and ECA, but nevertheless, uh, we can pass decisions. Since two, three, four years ago, the situation, the situation uh, has changed, thank God. And I think that, and I used to say this, right now the FIFA transfer regulations are a CBA rather than decisions or regulations passed by the FIFA Council. So what we are doing is a kind of collective bargaining agreement between the parties. Right now it's completely difficult, or I would say impossible, to pass new regulations on this topic without the permission, acceptance, green light from FIPRO, ECA, confederations, and member association. And this is good, really, really, really good. From time to time it's difficult, it's tough, you know, but I think that in the end the outcome is very positive because it's the agreement of three or four parties on a specific topic. But after um, having introduced a little bit the, the, the history of the problem, the situation, and why we are in 2019, let me give a short presentation about the roadmap of the transfer reform. And I would like to start with the election of the new FIFA president, still more or less new, even though he, he has been reelected in Paris uh, a few months ago. So the, the, the FIFA president is, this, is Mr. Gianni Infantino, a Swiss pure Italian lawyer. He, is the, oh, he was the former UEFA general secretary, and he was the man with some other individuals, of course, behind the agreements in 2001. So at that time, in 2001, when FIFA reached the agreement with the European Commission, so UEFA was extremely active as well, um, um, and Gianni Infantino was the UEFA's representative in these negotiations with some of the friends very close to, to us. So when he was elected in 2016, one of the first priorities was, well, you know, after 15 years, I know the system, we need to change this. With these figures on the table, we need to do something to evolve, and that's why what he planned is we need, for the first time, a kind of a stakeholders committee within FIFA. We need to invite FIPRO, we need to invite the clubs, we need to invite the leagues to come to FIFA, and we need to uh, do something together. Rather than collaboration, we need a collective bargaining agreement. We need to move forward all together in order to change the regulations. And that's why the, the Football Stakeholders Committee was conformed uh, in 2017 with the statutes in 2016, if I'm not wrong. And uh, in the first meeting, the, the committee noted uh, that we need to ref uh, reform the transfer system all together. At that time, I think that the idea of the Football Stakeholders Committee is to work hard on the process and launch the new FIFA transfer regulations. But then I think that we realized that this is really difficult, and that's why the Football Stakeholders Committee decided to split a little bit the process. Let's start with minor matters, narrow issues, so the most urgent ones. Let's move to maybe some of the complicated aspects, and let's try to close the picture with some of the pending issues. So what you have on the screen is this process, the first reform package from March 2017 until June 2018, and I will introduce the main points uh, uh, in a few minutes. The second reform package from July 2018 until right now, uh, we expect that the FIFA Council endorse the decision of the Football Stakeholders Committee on the 24th, 25th of October in Shanghai, in China. Um, and after that, again, we will start drafting the regulations on agents, on clearing house, on loans, in collaboration with the uh, stakeholders. Um, of course, there are some pending points that we need to discuss and we need to address, uh, very important, at least from my 
personal understanding, like minors, like buyout clauses, Article 17, and this is something that uh, most likely we will start in November, maybe after Christmas, I don't know, we need a, a bit of rest, uh, a relax, after a very intensive uh, year flying all around the world with these meetings, but uh, anyway, either in November, December, January, we need to start with the pending points that again I will introduce uh, later on. Let's start with what FIFA decided between March 2017 and June 2018, the so-called first reform package. Uh, this first package was focused on very particular circumstances around players in very particular country, countries. So we, saw, we, we call these narrow issues something that we need to solve quickly and the players uh, needed a, a quick uh, response from the stakeholders and FIFA. And that's why um, we started the process again in 2007. So the FIFA administration worked hard with the stakeholders uh, through the whole year. The Bureau of the Player Status Committee approved uh, these new articles, Article 14, 2, 14 Bs, new Article 17, 1, 18.6, and the famous and very practical, I think, Article 24, uh, bis. So FIFA Council in March entered into force in 1st June 2018. This is what we call first package, narrow issues, and these uh, uh, five topics were Article 4, uh, 14, Paragraph 2, so abuse behavior, against players, 14 bis, termination on a contract for understanding salaries. Uh, this uh, complicated, always complicated Article 17 with the calculation for the compensation of a breach of contract, the 18-6 grace periods, and finally, the, 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 the nice Article 24 bits, execution of monetary decisions. Uh, since what I can say, I joined the company in September 2018. So uh, if I have to look back and if I, if I had to look ahead, bearing in mind the, the, the number of cases and the complexity, so I think that you know, all these measures uh, had a very positive impact on the market. So from a strictly legal standpoint, I think that all these measures are working well. Um, particularly Article 24Bs. So I think that uh, you know the, the system is completely different than in the past. You now uh, player status department does not send documents to disciplinary and then disciplinary enforce the decisions. It's more or less automatic. So we are facing the first cases uh, uh, at CAS when it comes to the enforcement of Article 24Bs and we are waiting for these uh, decisions from the CAS. We are fully confident that the CAS panels will endorse the application of this Article 24 base, um, and for sure we will hear very soon about uh, these new decisions. But again, FIFA's view on the narrow issues on the first reform package is very positive. I think that we did great. Uh, players are also happy with these measures, even though players are always demanding. And this is good because it's the way to evolve. But the first uh, package, again, is running well, and, and, and particularly this Article 24B is, is helping a lot of all of us. I will move now to something that uh, uh, is more or less new. It's not the first package, so most of you, all of you, are now uh, 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 practicing the new package with different articles. But of course, what is new for all of us, even for the FIFA and FIFA stakeholders, is the decision passed by the Football Stakeholders Committee on the 25th of September 2019 in Zurich. So the so-called second reform package that will affect uh, what it is called the FIFA clearinghouse, the agents or intermediaries, uh, loans, and um, a little bit, even though we need to continue our discussions, the so-called training rewards, solidarity mechanism, and training compensation. We are still considering what to do with this. 
is a pending topic. I would say general principles have been endorsed, approved, but uh, for the moment we don't know how to tackle exactly this point. Anyway, I will give a short presentation about clearinghouse agents and loans. These are some posts on Twitter concerning the decisions uh, and also the official media release issued by FIFA two days ago in the context of this Football Stakeholders Committee. Uh, what the Football Stakeholders Committee decided at the meeting, apart from some other matters or relevant matters, is some ideas about the clearing house, some ideas about agents, and some new ideas about loans, international loans in football. So again, this is official media release, and if you go to Twitter, that is always very active, positive or negative, uh, you know, you will find a lot of posts about this decision of the FIFA committee. Uh, a few months ago, in, I think that it was on 25th of July, 2019, so two months ago, uh, FIFA takes the first step for the establishment and operation of the so-called FIFA Clearing House. What we did is we announced this on the uh, web page. We, 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 did, uh, we made a lot of noise about this in order to look for partners. No? FIFA, UEFA, the Spanish FA, we know common ball, of course. Uh, we know how to organize more or less football competitions, more or less, sometimes with problems. Uh, but of course, FIFA is not a bank uh, when it comes to transactions at worldwide level, compliance issues, different bank accounts, different currencies is a little bit challenged. That's why on the 25th of July, we launched this process, tender process, an open process, a request for proposal in order to look for partners. Uh, so the first deadline finished on the 15th of September, so a few days ago. And we got at around 19 potential offers. So there are 19 potential companies ready to work with us in the FIFA Clearing House. Now the final deadline is on the 13th of September. They, that they need to confirm the proposal. Let's see the total number. But as from 1st of October until December, what we are going to do is to select the best company to work with us uh, in the next years to help us developing the so-called FIFA Clearinghouse, particularly from a banking perspective, compliance perspective, that is the most challenging aspect for us. Very recurrent uh, slide and, and photo. Uh, these are figures also coming from TMS, accurate or not accurate, we don't know. We tend to say these figures are accurate or are figures declared into the system. So the figures are self-explanatory. Uh, FIFA training rewards expected and actual. So if we focus on 2018, for instance, so what clubs should receive based on TMS uh, data uh, is $351 million. What they are receiving is 67. So we estimate that less than 1% of the 5% is finally distributed for different factors, and you know better the system than me. So in the end, uh, the, the system is based on bona fide, so clubs should pay uh, training compensation, should pay solidarity contribution, so there are nice clubs around the world that they are always trying to comply with the rules, others are a little bit lazy, others disregard the system, so, and in the end, you know, the training clubs should file a complaint before our famous player status department. Others disappear, others don't know anything about the, the life of the player. So, if we combine all these factors, the conclusion is clubs all around the world, they are losing a lot of money. And it's our mission the, mission, the mission of FIFA, the confederations, the stakeholders, to guarantee that the system in place, because the system was born based on this principle. So clubs, training clubs should be paid for training players. So, but in the end, after 15, 20 years, we say, well, the system does not 
uh, work. So the conclusion, the obvious conclusion is we need to change the system. Again, these are figures provided by FIFA TMS uh, based on the contracts uh, uh, of the system. Exactly the same if we compare agents' commissions with training rewards, solidarity and uh, training compensation. So if we focus in on 2018, for instance, according to TMS, spending on agents' commissions is uh, $548 million, for sure it's more. Uh, payments to training clubs, either solidarity or, uh, or, or training, is almost 100 million. So in the end, there is a, an imbalance here. So, you know, uh, FIFA is not against agents, so we would like to work with the agents. Uh, agents are uh, an important figure in the context of the international transfer market, but these figures do not reflect our objectives. That's why we need to amend the regulations and also agents. Well, if you ask me how the system will operate in terms of FIFA Clearinghouse, the answer is a little bit unclear right now. We are working on the project. First, we need to select our partner by 31st December 2019, I hope. And then we need to start operating the system. What we have in mind, of course, you know, we have already launched some internal studies. Uh, the, the guys at FIFA are working hard on this project. So the, the idea is very simple. The details are for sure uh, another story, but you know, uh, the, 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 the system is, is, is simple. So imagine that we have a transfer between a uh, lovely Colombian club, America de Cali, uh, and Yokohama Marinos from Japan. We have some friends from Japan, Kengo, and some other friends. So, and imagine I'm a lawyer by profession, and so I don't know anything about numbers and mathematics and blah, blah, blah. Imagine I would prefer always to use $100 million. So, that means 5% is $5 uh, million. So uh, imagine that Yokohama Marinos has to distribute these $5 million into the training clubs of this lovely Colombian player. So how the system will operate. So as soon as the transfer is finished in TMS, what FIFA Clearinghouse will do, either the FIFA Clearinghouse internal department or the FIFA Clearinghouse company will knock the door of Yokohama Marignos. So based on the TMS, we have just learned that this transfer has been executed. I would like to inform you that very soon we will knock your door again and you will be forced to distribute 5% of this amount into the training clubs. For the moment, stay quiet, relax, uh, and, and the bankers will come very soon. The FIFA administration then will produce the uh, passport the allocation statement of the player based on the data collected by the different national associations. We are working hard with this uh, from an IT perspective all around the world, so with FIFA Connect and FIFA TMS. So we are going to establish the final uh, allocation statement, player's passport of the player. Again, we will check, you know, the, the system works, I think it works. So, you know, we have data on the system, but even though we have data on the system, we are not going to produce the final player passport without the knowledge of the respective national associations. So, we are going to open a quick process between FIFA and the respective national associations in order to confirm each year of the player. When the final passport is confirmed, we will knock again the door of Yokohama Marinos, you have to deposit $5 million on this FIFA account in the next 10 days. And the FIFA Clearinghouse, you, we will give the FIFA Clearinghouse the allocation statement with all the clubs, so Millonarios, Cali, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Also the amounts, the system will calculate the amount. And the FIFA Clearinghouse, that will be an external company or foundation or association or company, we don't know yet. So we'll do the compliance check and will pay and distribute this money to the training clubs. This is morally, more, more or less what we have in mind. But of course, critics or criticisms, uh, ideas, 
uh, good or bad ideas are always welcome. The system is still ongoing. We will face a lot of problems. The first one for us right now is data, of course, trying to collect data uh, from the respective member associations. There are 200 different programs. When it comes to registration, for instance, here at the Spanish FA, we have the famous Phoenix. In South America, they have Comet, so others have the FIFA system, the ETMS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a, an ongoing IT situation right now. We expect to solve this in the next 12 months. Um, if you are now considering the next question is, well, excellent, nice, sounds more or less fine, but tell me when the system will start operating. And this is the, the question for sure, and the answer is simple, I don't know. Uh, but what we can expect and what is our hope, wish, is to start operating this FIFA Clearing House as from 2021. So my goal, and hope we can reach this objective, will be the winter transfer window 2019-20, sorry, 2020-2021. So we would like to start with a, a small uh, problem rather than the big problem, but it will depend a little bit first on the national associations, the connectivity, connect ID, also how the system evolves with the FIFA clearing house. But the hope and particularly the message from the president of FIFA is uh, as soon as possible, and um, you know, when you have the possibility to discuss with him something about this. So the question is always recurrent, why the system is not working right now, but uh, you know, it's not simple, it's not easy, we are doing our best, and again, the idea is that the FIFA cleaning house will start operating as from 2021. With a lot of challenge, problems for sure, I remember well when FIFA decided to launch TMS in 2009, 2010, 2011. It was a mess for all of us. I was here at this company, Macy company, and I remember well, I remember the faxes, and then I remember, and now I remember, and now, and now I see TMS. So in, in the beginning, it was a little bit challenging for all of us, but now TMS works well. So we expect the same with the FIFA Clearing House. So the system will not be perfect. Uh, you know, uh, I'm very sorry, even though we are investing in Switzerland, but uh, you know, but we pre we, the idea is to work like a switch watch. That's the 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 the, the idea. But uh, and this is our uh, 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 wish. So I close here the FIFA cleaning house, and then of course I'm open to to discuss the, the operation of the FIFA cleaning house. And again, we welcome ideas. So this is an ongoing process. Um, uh, you know, we think that we are doing the right thing, uh, um, but of course, if you have ideas, comments, either by email, either today, then in the lunch, even today in the, in the dinner until midnight. So, you know, all ideas are more than welcome when it comes to the implementation and operation of the FIFA Clearing House. Let's move now to the, this uh, terrible topic, agents, intermediaries, player agents in football. Um, what can I say? Uh, in 2015, FIFA decided to um, or invited uh, uh, player agents to leave the system. Uh, it was the decision of FIFA, uh, and FIFA is always right, but uh, I have to admit that uh, maybe looking back, uh, this was not the best decision for football. So I was not there at that time, uh, and, and of course, in the end, you never know. It was a, for sure a, 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 a very discussed decision at that time. But looking back again, and particularly looking ahead, I think that the decision rendered in 2015 was not for the international transfer market or the football market at domestic level and at international level. That's why, since the beginning, the FIFA president uh, when he was elected on the 26th uh, uh, February 2016, uh, considered the possibility to go back and, and to welcome again player agents into the system. Again, for FIFA, for me personally, players uh, play an important role in our business. 
and they are always welcome within the system. And I think that FIFA should take the lead to regulate players all around the world. But it's challenging. Uh, you know, we discussed this morning on our way to, to, to La Rozas, the number of, the total number of player agents or intermediaries in, for instance, United Kingdom, the Premier League, so almost 3,000. I remember well, after nine years at the Spanish FA, uh, with some friends here, Kepa, Jorge, dealing with the accents with players, so we ended up with, cannot remember, maybe almost 2,000 uh, players registered at the Spanish FA. So imagine if we span this all around the world in Argentina, Bolivia, Vietnam, Japan. So the total number right now might be maybe 20,000 intermediaries all around the world, and they are completely free. So FIFA's ideas, and also the idea of the FIFA's stakeholders, ECA, FIPRO, Confederations, Leagues, is <clears throat> to welcome agents again into the system. And the five, six pillars of this, again, nice welcome, are the following. First, the reintroduction of mandatory licensing system. For sure, you have in mind, well, what are you going to do with this? Again, we don't know at this stage. We are working on different models with our um, agents experts at FIFA. Let's see how can we evolve. Again, education, that's important, and we have a completely different approach when it comes to education of players. In 2019, we can do a lot of things uh, completely different than in the past. Something that I like a lot, and I'm very focused on this uh, pot, is an effective dispute resolution system for agents at international level. So we all know the previous cases uh, at FIFA, so it took two or three years to render a decision. So if we move ahead and if we change the system, it's not to at least what they have in mind, and therefore it's not to make the same mistakes. What we need to put in place is an effective, quick, and cheap uh, dispute resolution system for players uh, at international level. And this is the aim. The fourth part is avoiding conflict of interest, and I will come back to this point when explaining the cap on commissions. That is the fifth important or relevant aspect of these potential new regulations. And also something that it is relevant for all of us in terms of compliance, transparency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All this was now uh, a trend at domestic and international level is that, in principle, all commissions should be paid uh, via the FIFA clearing house. This is the f these are the fundamental principles of what the football, the, the principles endorsed by the Football Stakeholders Committee. Again, these principles should be now ratified by the FIFA Council, and then the FIFA administration will start drafting the regulations uh, based on these principles. More about agents. Uh, this is public uh, since Wednesday, even before, uh, when we went to the annual general meeting of ECA, so with 250 clubs around, and we will disclose these caps. So in the end, uh, and maybe the, the, the figures are public since long time ago, I think that is the first time that FIFA publish and, and presents, introduce these uh, 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 caps or these uh, figures publicly. So the idea is that we are going to impose a cap on the transactions, and the general principle is that no dual or multiple representation, with one exception that we will see in the, 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 the next slide. So in a national, when the agent uh, um, works for the releasing club, he will be entitled to get up to 10% of the transfer fee. When the agent uh, works for the player, he will be entitled to get up to 3% of the player's salary, or if the agent plays for the engaging club, it's exactly the same. The cap is 3% of the player's salary. Again, one exception in which the new regulations will allow the player, uh, the, sorry, the agent, to work for the engaging club 
am the uh, uh, player. So uh, if this is the case, that will be allowed by the system as an exception. So the new system will not allow the player to work for the uh, releasing club, the player and the engaging club in order to avoid conflict of interest. So here, uh, the, the agent is entitled to get up to 6% of the player's salary, 3% by the club, 3% by the player with some exceptions. Uh, what can I say? Uh, what I can say is that we are convinced that this is the right way to do, all of us, ECA, CIPRO, uh, in a certain way, uh, World League Forums, Confederations, Member Associations. I know that uh, uh, some players, some groups will not be happy with this proposal, and we are fully aware that most likely we will face some challenge and um, cases, either before the ordinary courts, either before the Court of Arbitration for Sport, either, I don't know. But this is exactly the same situation when UEFA decided in 2004, 2005, when they implemented the financial fair play. So big noise around, so this is anti-competitive, will not go through the test of the European Commission, the European Court of Justice will deny the enforcement of these financial fair play regulations. Well, after 15 years, the system is still there after several cas uh, interesting cases, uh, I can say. Uh, the, the, the system is still there, even though uh, some groups went to ordinary courts in Belgium, in Paris, in some other places. So, well, we are more or less adapted, and all of us, we are lawyers, so happy to go to court, happy to go to CAS to defend the system. And the same example is TPO, when uh, FIFA decided to ban this practice in 2015, 2016, 2014, it was exactly the same. Noise around, so you know, the system will not pass the control of the Court of Arbitration for Sport, or will not pass the control of the ordinary courts. Well, after five years, I think that more or less uh, all are happy with the system. The system passed several checks, and again, we know that sooner or later, someone will not be very happy with the system and will be facing challenges before the CAS or before the ordinary courts. Well, let's play under these conditions. Again, we are fully aware and we are happy to play the match. We think that the system makes sense. The system is proportional. Uh, the system is legally robust. So it's not the first time that uh, we see uh, commissions on certain markets. So we are fully convinced that we will pass the relevant checks when it comes to agents, and particularly uh, commissions. Finally, loans. Uh, um, again, this is a recurrent problematic at domestic level, at international level. So it was identified as a priority problem for the tax force, for the Football Stakeholders Committee, and after long negotiations, with ECA, with FIPRO, with the World League Forums, with confederations, particularly UEFA, always very active in the context of, of the tax force with Julien and, and some member associations. This is the conclusion of our discussions, and this is the picture that, in principle, should be endorsed by the FIFA uh, Council uh, next month in, uh, um, in Shanghai. So we will start with the process in 2020-21, maximum loans in eight, out eight, 2021-22, six, seven, seven, and we will end up with six max loans in, six months loan out, with the sections of under 21 and training players. And we will give national associations a period of three years in order to implement the loan system at domestic level. Again, these are general principles. Uh, uh, that we were able to discuss uh, uh, and reach an agreement with the FIFA stakeholders. And now we need to translate these general principles into regulations. So there are still a lot of open uh, topics and particularities that uh, we will start discussing with the stakeholders 
very soon, but again, these are the general principles to be implemented at international level uh, uh, as from 20, uh, season 2021. Third package, the future. What can we expect uh, in the next months when it comes to the reform of the international transfer market, Carlos? So, uh, first point, fiscal regulations. Still a little bit uh, to be defined. Uh, let's see, I'm not absolutely sure what does it mean for fiscal regulations, but you know, we are open to discuss with all stakeholders the point, minors. Uh, again, always a recurrent problematic, particularly in some continents, in my lovely and beloved uh, Commonwealth area. Uh, mm, what can we do? We follow the instructions from the CAS and Efrain, and we go down to 16 years old at worldwide level, but will have an impact on, 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 on the market in on common ball. But again, we are looking on players and the situation of players. We are not taking care of, of the clubs. Well, it's always complex, and that's why we need a tax force. That's why we need uh, the stakeholders to reach an agreement. It's quite sides. Also, a, an important topic uh, in order to 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 help uh, to guide or to fight against this uh, uh, uncompetitive balance that is uh, there since long time ago, and also some general topics about transfer windows. These are, in principle, in principle, the main topics that uh, still remain open or I would say more open than the others, because there are other clearinghouse agents still open to be defined at a later stage in, in you know, to translate into regulations. But definitely, these are topics that we briefly discuss, particularly minors. We had one or two meetings focused on minors. It was uh, really impossible to reach an agreement. But again, we are very happy. Um, me, I'm very excited to continue this journey. Uh, all around the world with the stakeholders trying to find good solutions when it comes to fiscal regulations, minors, squad size, transfer windows, buyout clauses. So we are completely open. And we think that in 2020, 2021, hope that in 2020, we will very close to uh, uh, close uh, this uh, reform package with these four topics and who knows, maybe some other important Matters. So, what next? Fiscal minus quad sides transfer windows, and of course, uh, uh, and, and here today, I would like to thank you very much uh, the FIFA stakeholders. So, FIPRO. So, there are some representatives here. ECA. There are some representatives, representatives here. The World League forums. The confederations. So, uh, this is not a FIFA process. This is again a collective binding agreement process since uh, time ago, thank God. Uh, we are very happy uh, and, and well comforted with all these partners around. We are doing our best. Again, sometimes the system is not perfect. It's the combination of different factors and, and the regulations are uh, good regulations thanks to these groups, the Confederations, FIPRO, ECA, and World League Forums. So uh, it's 1.40 in the morning for the Spanish, 1.40 in the afternoon for the rest of the world. Uh, but of course, I cannot close my presentation with the typical FIFA video. So the FIFA video, uh, videos are mm, very welcome uh, uh, at worldwide level with these nice uh, pictures, movements, and, and sound. But definitely, I would like to show you today you know, the typical FIFA video. We are working hard in Malaysia, development football pitches, and we spend the money in the national associations, and we retain zero in Switzerland. That's not true, of course. But uh, I would like to play a, a, a nice video, something that we are working, on, uh, working hard since uh, six months ago, and I think that will have a, an impact on all of us because I wouldn't say that it's a revolution, but for sure it's an evolution, yeah, particularly if you look back. I will play the video, the FIFA, nice FIFA video right now. I'm sorry, it's in English. I have an, we have a, a Spanish version. Carlos was behind all these videos, working with the technicians. We have French, German, and Spanish and English version. Um, I will play the, the, again, unfortunately, the, the English one. But let's uh, watch the video. FIFA 2.0 
Europe, the vision for the future, which was launched by FIFA President Gianni Infantino in October 2016, is FIFA's commitment to transparency. This transparency concerns not just FIFA's governance of football, but also its relationship with stakeholders. In this regard, the decisions made by the FIFA Congress and Council, the rulings issued by FIFA's various independent judicial bodies, and FIFA's interactions with the Court of Arbitration for Sport, are key matters that should be readily accessible to everyone who comes into contact with our institution. Legal.fifa.com is the instrument through which FIFA guarantees the utmost transparency in our regulatory work and decision making. On legal.fifa.com, member associations, clubs, leagues, players, and all other stakeholders will have direct access to the following documents. 1. Decisions of the Disciplinary Committee and the Appeal Committee. 2. Decisions of the Adjudicatory Chamber of the FIFA Ethics Committees. 3. Decisions of the Dispute Resolution Chamber and the Player Status Committee. 4. Decision taken by CAS where FIFA is a party. 5. Other materials of interest in legal aspects of FIFA. Legal.fifa.com That's the video. Um, and that's the new website that we have the intention to launch as from November 2019. You never know with IT guys, uh, but the idea is, you know, I changed available from three times. You know, in the beginning was 15 September. The guys told me the project is ready for your presentation in Madrid. Then I changed to 15 October. And last week I asked Carlos that he's behind. Thank you very much, Carlos and the whole disciplinary and ethics team for your help. I changed to 1st November 2019, and I can guarantee you that, you know, 1st of November, we are going to go live uh, in B, C, D, but we are going to, in a, in a way or in another way, but we are going to go live. The idea, as you have seen, is to publish all decisions with grounds, of course. We are not going to, to upload and to publish operative parts when the parties do not request the grounds. But the idea is to publish decisions and also rules, regulations, and some other materials, but particularly decisions rendered by the disciplinary committee and the appeals body, all decisions with grounds, as from 1st January 2019. So we cannot start in 2001. Let's, let's wait a little bit. The idea is, as from 2000, January, 1st January 2019, we are going to publish everything when it comes to disciplinary, disciplinary committee and appeals committee, ethics committee, all decisions rendered by the ethics committee as from 1st January 2019. Uh, in a different way, decisions coming from the player status department and the DRC or player status committee. And, and also something that is uh, maybe uh, relevant as well, uh, in the beginning, all cast cases as from 1st January 2019, in which FIFA is uh, a party. Of course, I refer to non-confidential cases, but we are going to publish, as WADA is doing, I think, in the web page, all cast cases when FIFA is a party. Again, it's not a revolution, it's evolution, and particularly for me, it's a question of common sense. This is something that we should have done uh, a long time ago, so we don't need to hide decisions, so there are some crap decisions. That's why from time to time, CAS uh, changed uh, FIFA decisions, but there are also very good decisions, any case, good or bad decisions. I think that we need to be open, transparent, so if we are right or we are wrong, this is something uh, normal in life, but the most important thing for us, particularly for the president, is and when it comes to all these legal aspects, that is always, you know, when you don't have a copy of the decision, it's easy to say, well, you know, the member of the FIFA committee or the president of whatever football federation is not guilty, he's a nice man. Okay, well, I invite you to read the decision. The decision is published, and then you can reach your own conclusions. And with this legalfifa.com that we have the intention <laughs> to launch as from 1st November, 2019, uh, I open here time for questions. For sure you have a lot of questions, or maybe you have a lot of questions concerning loans, agents, and some other aspects, clearing house. The only problem is I don't have all answers. Uh, but uh, in any case, I will do my best. Again, thank you very much to the Spanish FA for this splendid and amazing Congress, for this opportunity. Thanks for your time and for your passion. Thank you very much.
Gracias, Emilio. Vamos con el turno de preguntas. Por aquí la primera. It's lunchtime, eh, at the same time. Just to... <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name is Martina Skorvais, I'm from Vilnius, Lithuania, and I have a question related to persons who are more or less uh, outside of jurisdiction of FIFA, uh, the intermediaries. Uh, and considering the latest developments of FIFA disciplinary code and uh, the statutes, FIFA is uh, once again competent to, uh, to enforce the decisions of CAS coming from CAS ordinary uh, divisions. So my question is, would FIFA enforce the decision in favor of intermediary against a player and or a club. Thank you. Okay, thanks for, for your question. Um, I will be brave and, and, and I will tell you what I think. Uh, it does not mean that this is the approach of the FIFA Disciplinary Committee, of course, but I'm not a member of the FIFA Disciplinary Committee. In other words, the committee in the future can render a different decision. So what we had in mind when we draft the new Article 15 that, again, I think that it was a very positive decision. It, it was a kind of an, an, an alum, um, it was, I'm sorry. Uh, in 2011, FIFA decided to take away ordinary awards from the enforcement of Article 64. And now in 2019, as you remember, we amend Article 64, now the famous 15 and also ordinary awards are part of the FIFA family. Uh, this anomaly now, excellent, so this anomaly has been solved right now. Again, I will be brave, and I have to admit that what we had in mind is that the article will also apply to decisions rendered in ordinary proceedings at cash level when it comes to intermediaries. This is what we had in mind. Oh, I had in mind when I worked hard with uh, uh, Carlos uh, and some of the friends around uh, uh, Jaime as well in Article 15. Having said that, uh, uh, again, this is something to be considered by the uh, disciplinary committee. I can say that you, for sure you have noted this transitorial provision, no? on Article 72, if I'm not wrong, of the FIFA Disciplinary Code, by means of which we welcome ordinary awards at uh, uh, FIFA level, but of course, if these proceedings started as from 1st August 2019. So, in other words, we expect ordinary cases or ordinary awards from CAPS in the next six, 12 months. Uh, if not, imagine th hundreds and hundreds of course awards coming to FIFA uh, on the 2nd of August. That's why we introduced this uh, provision. But again, I'm brave, uh, I'm free to say what I think, uh, because we are living in a, democracy, in, in, the, in a democracy. So again, my feeling is that Article 15 covers this situation. What the chairman of the disciplinary committee and the members of the disciplinary committee think is completely different, or should be different, of course. Vamos a la zona izquierda. Sí, bueno, buenos días. Me, respecto a la, al clearing house, me, se me plantean determinadas interrogantes y, y quería formularlas, Emilio. Eh, ¿Dónde estás? Allí a la izquierda. Bebequian de Montevideo. Hombre. ¿Cómo estás? Muy bien, ¿y tú? Me alegro, bien, gracias. <risa> eh, estas son algunas de ellas. Por ejemplo, ¿qué va a pasar con las variables que se estipulan en los contratos de transferencia? Correcto. Ese seguimiento de las variables. Segundo, ¿qué va, los clubes que en aquellas situaciones polémicas, conflictivas, en cuanto a los derechos de formación o mecanismos de solidaridad, van a tener la posibilidad de decirle a FIFA... Eh, en este caso, discrepo, no tengo que pagar. Okay. O al revés, en este caso, yo tengo que reclamar aun cuando FIFA no haya ordenado ese pago. Uh -huh. Son situaciones inversas, Totalmente. pero me parece eh, planteables. Después, eh, hay situaciones que, que me parece que bien podrían plantearse antes de la aplicabilidad de del clearing house, por ejemplo, eh, de cortes reglamentarios que se sancionen al club que no distribuya 
la, solidar la solidaridad, por ejemplo, o pague dentro de los 30 días la indemnización por formación. Eh, me parece que perfectamente, que soluciones rápidas, sin recurrir a una decisión de FIFA, ya por el no pago de, al vencimiento de los 30 días. Me parece que podría ser una, una solución en el sentido que FIFA piensa para eh, que los clubes formadores se hagan rápidamente de ese, de ese dinero. Y por último, si la, esas medidas reglamentarias surten efecto, ¿podríamos seguir pensando en una solución de una Cámara de Compensación? Gracias, Emilio. Muy bien. Eh... Estaba tomando notas porque yo me hago mayor y me olvido ya de las cosas. ¿eh? No, no, por eso no es que estaba haciendo otra cosa. Voy a contestar en castellano a, a la pregunta que es casi mi idioma materno. Eh, en cuanto al control de los pasaportes y qué, 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 qué rol van a tener los clubes. Bien, aquí lo, lo expliqué muy rápidamente en la presentación. Nuestra idea es que, aunque entendemos que los datos que va a haber en el programa son accurate, o sea, son datos ciertos, o lo que es lo mismo. Cuando el Clearing House funcione bien, el programa va a poder determinar claramente de los 12 a los 23 dónde ha estado el jugador, sin margen de error. Entendemos que al principio esto es un ideal y realmente no es algo que va a ser cierto, ¿no? porque eh, una cosa es que nosotros vivamos en Zúrich, en la FIFA, y la otra es la realidad del fútbol, que es muy diferente. Entonces, cuando tengamos que eh, eh, conectar, a, por ejemplo, a nuestros amigos de la AFA o a nuestros amigos de Japón o a nuestros amigos de Sudáfrica en el sistema, estoy seguro que los datos no van a ser absolutamente accurate, lo que puede tener claramente un impacto sobre el pasaporte y sobre todo sobre los pagos, lógico. Nuestra idea ahí es hacer en el principio, en los primeros años, un paso intermedio, mediante el cual nos fiamos del programa, pero no del todo. Lo que va a significar que en un proceso rápido que estamos diseñando, la FIFA contactará a las federaciones para que revaliden el pasaporte. ¿Cómo lo hagan ellos? ¿Con sus clubes o como, o como sea? Es una cuestión que probablemente compete a las asociaciones, pero la idea es que antes de ordenar la distribución, hacer el pasaporte final y pagar a los clubes, vamos a reconfirmar el pasaporte con las asociaciones nacionales y, en su caso, con los clubes, las asociaciones nacionales. Por tanto, vamos a darle la oportunidad de que si hay errores en ese pequeño proceso y rápido se confirmen. Evidentemente, ahí pueden ocurrir problemas, porque, como va a pasar, un jugador puede estar registrado en dos asociaciones al mismo tiempo. ¿Qué tenemos en pensado inicialmente? Hacer un sistema ágil, sin jueces de la Comisión del Estatuto del Jugador, un sistema puramente administrativo, donde la FIFA va a decidir, en base a los documentos que haya, en la edad de los 13 años, dónde estaba registrado el jugador y con las pruebas, si alguien está desconforme puede recurrir esa decisión administrativa de la FIFA ante el Tribunal Arbitral del Deporte. Pero, en principio, en los primeros años, hasta que pensemos que los datos son 100% accurate, la idea es reconfirmar el pasaporte en un fax track uh, procedure con las asociaciones nacionales. Pagos parciales, también lo hemos considerado. ¿Qué pasa con los pagos parciales sobre la solidaridad? Uh, aquí hay diferentes teorías dentro de la Administración, Mm, eh, nuestra idea es que los pagos parciales y la solidaridad va a ir con los pagos parciales. Es decir, eh, en principio el, el Clearing House eh, solo pagará los pagos que estén en vigor de acuerdo con el contrato. ¿Eso significa que lo tengamos que hacer cuatro veces? Eh, probablemente significa que lo tengamos que hacer cuatro veces, pero es difícil pedirle la solidaridad por avanzado a, al club. Por tanto, eso es lo que ahora tenemos en, en la cabeza. Por tanto, si hay alguien que tiene otras ideas y nos ayudan, como digo, están, son siempre bienvenidas. La tercera cuestión eh, vamos a, es algo que yo creo la FIFA debería haber hecho mucho tiempo. ¿no? Es decir, eh, el Clearing House es algo que se necesita, pero quizás hubiera necesitado un poco menos y lo hubiera, hubiera, la, la, la evolución hubiera sido menor si eh, la obligación de pago hubiera generado una responsabilidad disciplinaria. Eh, probablemente lo es, incluso técnicamente, porque existe una obligación legal de distribuirlo. Evidentemente, nunca se ha abierto un procedimiento disciplinario, pero eso te obligaría a, uno, primero, no, no, te, te obligaría a, a hacer un procedimiento 
ante la comisión disciplinaria, hacer el enforcement, esas aplicaciones llegarían al TAS, es decir, estaríamos básicamente en un problema semirresuelto, pero todavía con muchos procesos, sobre todo se seguiría perdiendo mucho dinero, porque hay clubes que han desaparecido, eh, eh, clubes que no saben dónde, dónde, dónde están sus jugadores, y entonces la FIFA al final tendría que hacer una especie de clearing house para, contra, para ver la trazabilidad de los jugadores. Por tanto, podría haber sido una solución intermedia hace tiempo para mejorar los gaps que hay sobre las cantidades, pero no la solución final. ¿Es la Cleaning House una solución final? Uh, probablemente no, pero sin duda es algo más evolucionado de lo que tenemos y algo en el que estamos confiados que va a aportar mucho dinero a los clubes formadores, que, de, de, que esa fue la base del acuerdo entre las partes en 2001. Y la última pregunta no la he comprendido. Si un club eh, tiene la posibilidad de decirle a FIFA, mire, estoy en desacuerdo, yo no voy a pagar por tal razón. O al revés, presentar una reclamación ante un organismo jurisdiccional cuando FIFA no le reconoce a priori ese derecho. Sí, habrá esa posibilidad también igual en el modelo Fast Track, si un club deniega eh, la obligación del pago del mecanismo de solidaridad o del derecho de formación, se le va a dar la posibilidad de que FIFA dicte una decisión final al respecto y a partir de ahí será apelación. ¿Esto va a paralizar el proceso? Algunos sí, es evidente, ¿no? pero también hay que proteger los derechos de las partes y nosotros no tenemos razón siempre. Entonces, habrá procesos que estén en parte parados por apelaciones, pero la gran cantidad de los procesos, o sea, lo que nos importa, eh, eh, si el sistema funciona, eh, funcionará muchísimo más rápido, ¿no? es evidente. Vamos aquí a la segunda fila. Sí. Yes. Uh, Frans de Wegen, thank you Emilio for your presentation. I have three questions. Uh, the first one are related to the uh, newly uh, website and the decisions. Will it be a selection of the decisions or will all decisions be published? Okay, and will they be le anonymous or okay. will the names of the parties be mentioned? Excellent. Um, the idea is to publish all decisions with grounds, with grounds that uh, we don't have 200 of 500, so decisions with grounds rendered by the disciplinary committee, the appeals committee, and the ethics committee. Decisions of the disciplinary committee and appeal committee will not be anonymized, so the, 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 the English term is complicated for a Spanish speaker. Uh, when it comes to the ethics committee, these decisions will be anonymized. No? That's the term. That's the idea. When it comes to cast decisions, these decisions will be the, 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 the award that we receive, the, the public award. Uh, dispute resolution mechanism for the uh -huh. agents. Will this be a new body within FIFA? Or will this be, for example, the PSC will deal with this, these cases? Uh, yeah, uh, it's also a good question. What we have in mind is to set up a new committee, a specific committee, Uh, just for disputes between agents, clubs, and players. Um, um, we had a very positive discussions with FIBA. Uh, we went to Geneva, uh, lovely place, French-speaking area of Switzerland. So we had very positive meetings with them. We are trying to do something in line with the FIBA BAT Tribunal. Will not be an award, will be an internal decision of FIFA. But uh, you know, we would like to take inspiration for the fast track procedure uh, of FIBA with a kind of chairman and three or four single judges. So what I can say is that we are not going to create a new monster with judges and everything and 20 days deadline and new ten and extension and hearing. So what we need is an efficient and good and quick tribunal in order to render decisions based on the principle of uh, single judges. That's all. That's the idea that I, uh, we have in mind, I would say. Okay. We are running behind the, 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 the schedule a little bit. Dos, sí. dos hacemos dos últimas preguntas. No, no, I'm happy. Eh? Una, una corta, Emilio, buenas tardes. Aquí al lado de Bequian, eh, Martín Auleta de Argentina. Hola, Martín. Eh, referida a... Eh, los cap commissions, las comisiones a los sí. agentes y en orden o para entender eh, los motivos de la decisión. ¿Cuál es el razonamiento o los fundamentos que tomaron en cuenta para establecer 
distintos porcentajes según eh, a quién esté o de qué lado esté la gente trabajando, si del club que vende o que transfiere al jugador, o del jugador mismo o del club que incorpora al jugador. Mm. Es una pregunta compleja de contestar. Bien, lo decía antes, ¿no? Al final, lo que se acuerda probablemente es el, peor de lo, el, el mejor de los peores sistemas, ¿no? O sea, el mejor sistema en el que FIFA hubiera implementado, eso es evidente. Como eso ya no se puede hacer, afortunadamente, eh, la gente negocia. Entonces, ¿a qué, ¿de dónde vienen los porcentajes? Pues de una negociación basada en criterios de proporcionalidad, basada también en la protección de los jugadores, del uso abusivo de, la, de los porcentajes por parte de los agentes, de otros modelos a los que hemos visto internacionalmente, modelos bancarios, modelos en otras ligas. Eh, eh, es un conjunto de factores. Es difícil. Eh, estas variables han, han sido modificadas en el marco de la negociación. Por tanto, si tu pregunta es por qué el 3 y no el 10 o por qué el 17, la respuesta es un conjunto de factores han hecho que... Sé que no te ayudo mucho con no, esto. No, sí, pero puntualmente, si es posible, si no entiendo la, la dificultad de la, de la respuesta, ¿por qué la diferencia entre los porcentajes? O sea, ¿por qué no, por ejemplo, el 10% en los tres casos? Bueno, si ves, el, el, los, 10, los porcentajes están basados en, en uno en el transfer fee y otro en lo que cobra el jugador. Entonces, esa es la primera diferencia. ¿no? Eh, eh, en cuanto al releasing club, es el 10%. En cuanto al engaging, es el 3% eh, del salario. Entonces, eh, la, ya la percepción es totalmente diferente. Pero, bueno, es complejo. Eso no quiere decir que es, una formula, es, es la piedra filosofal guardada y que nunca vamos a decir por qué, sino que yo creo que lo que se ha hecho es aplicar un poco la proporcionalidad, el sentido común, el acuerdo entre todas las partes, lo que veíamos justo, teniendo en cuenta sistemas bancarios o eh, recientemente implementados, no tan recientemente, en el ámbito de la Unión Europea y en otras ligas profesionales al, alrededor del mundo. Hacemos la última en el pasillo de la izquierda. Hola, Emilio. Emilio. Sí. Ah, la izquierda. Here on the left side. Eh. Hi. Emilio, thank you for your great presentation. Um, um, You know that I'm working for a small German football club, and that's why I have a question with regard to the um, cap of agents. Um, from a practical point of view, it's a quick question. Um, is it regarded to be of, um, or you know, intended to be of um, obligatory nature, or just a recommendation for national associations and clubs? Because as far as I know, this has been discussed in the past uh, month also. This is my question, very okay. quickly and straightforward. Yeah. Uh, um, And I, I have I a address, remark. I, so. Okay, I will address this question right now. Uh, subject to the FIFA Council, so I would say that the system will become mandatory. So it's not a okay. recommendation. Good. So this is an agreement, and, 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 and the agreement will be enforceable throughout the regulations. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then one final remark, and then we can all go uh, for lunch, I think, because I'm the last one, right? Yes. Okay. Um, the remark is, I wonder about the figures on the caps, the 3% on the salary, which seems to be low um, compared to nowadays payments, because, you know, as far as I know, in Germany, we pay about 7 to 12% on player salary, um, but I really appreciate it. But the 10% on transfer fees seems to be very high for us because if we stick to your example um, of, for example, yeah, a transfer of 100 million, which is not that unusual nowadays between big clubs, it's 10 million, which goes to the agent. Um, I just wonder about that because um, for me it seems to be a bit disbalanced, but that's it. Well, why not? Might be it's more or less the the, the same question. No concern. Ah, sorry, I didn't understand no. that because it wasn't Spanish. No, well, no problem. So, <laughs> me neither, <Sorry. laughs> Martin. <laughs> so, no, it's more or less the same question. Why we finally decided them for releasing three and three for agent club engaging. So it's a combination of factors. So we are taking inspiration from some of the markets, some of the leaks trying to go for a proportionate system. So, and this is the, the agreement between the parties. So, you know, again, we think that this is the right way, even though, you know, you have just recognized, you know, when it comes to the uh, engaging club, 
and the player is low when it comes to the releasing club stem, so you know, the, maybe the system is not perfect. Again, what we think is that from a strictly legal point of view is robust um, and is proportionate. This is the most important factor for us. ¿Algún otro comentario, cuestión, no duda? Hay muchas, pero yo creo que okay, lo dejamos aquí de momento. Gracias, Emilio. Gracias. Thank you very much.